and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Today on the show, we're going to talk about one of the worst insect problems you can have. It's the grasshopper. We'll talk a little about its life cycle and at what point you should pull the trigger and control this bug. When you're out in your fields looking for bugs like the grasshopper, you may be pulling plant tissue analysis too, and that data can really help you, especially for building next year's fertility program. We'll talk about that today. Coming up later in the show, we will have our Weed of the Week segment. We've got Iron Talk as well, but first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about your lawn. Should you save your grass clippings? What should you do with those? Should they leave the lawn? Should they stay there? We want to answer that question today. All right, you want your lawn to look great. And you think about it, well, I don't want to have all these grass clippings laying out there. I'd love to bag them and, and have it just look nice and clean. I understand that. I understand that clean look. But you can still get that and leave your lawn clippings out there too by just clipping a little bit more often. Now, if you're a teenager at home <laughs> and you're saying, oh, I'm already mowing the lawn for mom and dad and I don't wanna have to mow it more often, you can. And when those clippings are a little shorter, you're not going to see them as much. Now, here's the reason that you wanna leave those clippings out there. They have a lot of fertility in them. Grass clippings on average have an analysis of about a 4-1-2. So 4% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 2% potassium. So it's fertilizer. Every time you're clipping those lawns, you're putting that fertility back in your lawn. Here's what we're really saying. If you want to take those grass clippings off the lawn, you've got to somehow replace that fertility that you've just removed. In other words, you're going to need to spend dollars to put that N, P, and K and micronutrients back out there on your lawn. Now, assuming you don't want to spend that money, that should be good incentive for you to figure out some way to get those grass clippings really chewed up, really mulched up so they still look nice and you can leave them out there on the lawn. Now, sometimes it may be a better deal to take those clippings off the lawn. Wait, you just said they've got fertility value and all this. Yes, they do. But sometimes you may have a disease going on in your lawn, like for example, rust. Uh, I know I've seen it before in lawns where you walk through the lawn, your shoes just turn orange because there's rust on the grass blades. Well, in that case, if you've got something like that going on, you wanna clip those grass blades off and save those clippings. You can compost them or, or just haul them away to the landfill but get them off your lawn. That's gonna reduce that disease pressure that's out there. The other time you may consider bagging that up and hauling it away or composting it is if your lawn just gets way too big. Now, you get a couple strategies here. If your lawn, you, you go away on vacation, you come back and it's really, really long, well, you can just set your blades up very high and, and go across and just clip an inch or two off and then come back again and do the same thing. Or you can haul them away and just do it all in one shot. It's up to you but you may consider a couple of options where, yeah, it's not every time I wanna blow those clippings back in my lawn. One last thought I wanna leave you with here is, let's say you're in a really hilly area and those grass clippings can wash down the hill and into a river or a lake. That could be a real problem because again, those lawn clippings have nutrients in them. And if nutrients get into the river, they get into the lake, that could cause an algae bloom. So just be a little bit careful with that. It depends a lot on the situation, but for the most part, when we have flat lawns where there's no risk of those clippings going anywhere, we would highly encourage you leave the clippings on the lawn because that's just free fertilizer for your next grass grow. Well, fortunately, you don't have to deal with our weed of the week in your lawns. We'll show you how to stop this weed coming up later in the show. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Increase your productivity with Hypro's Dual React Control System. 
The dual nozzle body design allows you to drive at the speed you want while maintaining the rate and droplet size you need. Hypro, helping you spray better. With the success of the Case IH Tiger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us. Because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Unlike your nutrient investment with Quick Roots technology, it contains two powerful microbes that can help free nutrients bound in your soil, which can improve access to key nutrients for healthy crops, N, P, and K. Applying Quick Roots technology to seed can lead to improved root and shoot growth, increased yield potential, and maximized nutrient investment. See how you can make your fertilizer dollar go further at MonsantoBioAg.com slash Quick Roots. The biggest expense on most farms is fertility. Well, how are you going to improve your fertilizer program going forward? Certainly, we want you pulling soil samples, but another thing you can do is pull some tissue samples on your farm. We want to talk today about how you can use this year's tissue samples to change next year's fertility program. We've talked about pulling plant tissue samples before on the show, and you can certainly find some good handy guides. We've got one right at agphd.com if you're looking for that type of information as to which leaves are you going to pull. But as you're doing that, you're going to get results back from the lab on all the nutrients. You don't just want N, P, and K. You want to know what sulfur is and, and other secondary nutrients and also micronutrients too. When you see the full profile of, of what's in your plants, this is where everything begins. Now you may say, okay, I got a bunch of numbers back and the lab says I'm at a sufficient level on most of them. Some of them it's low or deficient. Where do I start and what levels do I really need? Well, that is a great question as to what exact levels you're going to need, but this is going to give you a pretty good idea of some problem areas that are a little bit out of balance. Okay, so this is no real big secret, but a lot of the high yield farmers we've talked to around the country have basically just told us this. They said, what we do is pull tissue samples once per week all during the season. Let's say it's a high yield spot and let's say it's a low yield spot in the same field. All right, now I've got two different spots. If you want to have an average spot too, you certainly can. But anyway, go to the exact same spots all season long, so every week and you've got all this data. All right, so let's say you raise 250 bushel corn and you can look now at each one of the different growth stages in your crop. If you just simply record GDUs or that growth stage, now you know, all right, at that level, in order to get 250 bushel corn, I know that I need to be at least at this certain number, this percentage or this parts per million of that nutrient in the plant. Now, that's not a foolproof way to do it because what do we always talk about here in the show? There's always one yield limiting factor. In other words, one of those nutrients needed to be increased and probably just one. Which one is it? I don't know. So unfortunately, there isn't a lot of great data out there on really high yielding crop. Nobody has the exact formula to say, all right, to go from 250 to 300, which nutrients do I need to increase? And at what stage in my crop? Nobody in the world knows. So you can build your own database. You can work with other farmers to build your database. But here's the whole point. If you look at tissue samples all through the year and you see you do have some things that are standing out as, boy, that, they're saying that's deficient. I mean, half of the weeks that I tested, what should that tell you about improving that nutrient for next year's crop? Let's say it's zinc, for example. Well, with zinc, it doesn't move well in the plant. So yes, you can do a little bit of foliar feeding and increase the level just for a little while in that plant, 
but ultimately if your soil test says low and your nutrient analysis in your plant tissue says deficient fairly consistently through the season, you better increase your soil levels. That's how the zinc is going to get into the plant consistently week after week is by building that soil up. So that's one of the things and one of the ways that we would talk about tweaking your fertility program going forward. Well, it is good when you're doing something like that. Say you're putting out a bunch of zinc just to see, well, I put a bunch of zinc on, is it showing up in my sample here? And then when you're talking about just your own farm, you've got multiple fields. You say, well, my zinc level is here in this field, but I'm not there in the other fields. And that may give you an indication of, of some spots where this could be a yield limiting factor for your crop. Now, one thing that I would say too, is people will look at, well, here's corn and I need zinc for the corn. Don't just think about, well, what's my tissue sample level? Also look at something like the Ag PhD fertilizer removal app, just to see how much you need in total to make sure, hey, I'm really gonna make sure I'm supplying what that crop is removing. And if I've got a deficiency out there, I'm not only gonna hit that sufficiency level of what that crop's gonna remove, I'm also gonna put some more out there so I can make things better going forward. One of the biggest things you can do to improve next year's crop is go right now look at the satellite maps on your farm or basically plant health or crop health maps, whatever the company you're working with wants to call them, and just look at the bad areas on your farm in certain fields. Go to those areas, soil sample and tissue sample, and tissue sample for the rest of the summer. Do the same thing in a few good areas and start comparing the good areas with the bad areas. That's what we talk about all the time. If you just simply look at, hey, these are my best areas, these are my worst areas, quite often something there is going to stand out, either in the soil test or in the plant tissue analysis. Use that data to fine tune your fertility program. It's not necessarily about spending more money, it's about spending your money more wisely when it comes to fertilizer. Having optimum nutrition for your crop is really important if you want big yields. So is controlling our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this weed later in the show. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm. Because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. This agro liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But Wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources, the research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Make every minute of the growing season count. Schedule your equipment for a genuine Case IH parts and service uptime inspection at Titan Machinery. Our professional service technicians have the training and experience to pinpoint and repair problems before they have a chance to shut you down during the season. Avoid the high cost of in-season downtime. Give yourself the peace of mind knowing your equipment is ready to work. Schedule your equipment today by going to uptime18.com or calling your local Titan Machinery dealer. That's Titan Machinery, providing you with genuine Case IH parts and service. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. 
a young agronomist, one of the first bugs I had a lot of dealings with was the grasshopper. It's a terrible insect, but fortunately, if you've got good moisture conditions, you usually don't see a real big problem with grasshoppers. Well, it certainly can be a tough bug, and with grasshopper, we don't normally think about it spreading disease through the field or something like that. We're just looking at the leaf feeding, and it can be substantial when you get a large number of grasshoppers moving into a field. The one good thing with grasshoppers is there's just one generation per year. It's going to start with what we call the nymph stage, and then it's going to go through a molting process where basically it sheds its old shell and continues to grow. Once it gets to the adult stage, then most grasshoppers are going to have wings. Once you see wings, basically you know you're in trouble. That bug is tougher to kill, it's gonna do a lot more feeding, and it's mobile. One of the other problems once that grasshopper reaches the adult stage is it can lay eggs, and now we've got next year's problem already started. So when we see grasshoppers in a ditch, for example, and you say, oh, they're just in the ditch, they're not out into my crop yet, hey, that's a great time to spray them. They haven't caused any crop damage, and now you aren't gonna have them laying eggs in that ditch where next year they could come out in your field too. So this is the interesting thing with grasshoppers. Normally with bugs, we talk about economic damage or what's the economic threshold in the crop. And what Darren is saying here is, I've got a crop sitting right next to this ditch where the grasshoppers are, so at the moment, it's caused zero economic damage. I have nothing in terms of an economic threshold, yet I still wanna spray. I know it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense, but what we do see with these grasshoppers is they're gonna move in, like I said earlier, in swarms. So they're just gonna start marching into that field and it happens especially when you've cut off their food. So if that ditch starts to get dry and you see the grass starting to turn brown, that'd be a good time to spray. If you're going to cut the ditch, that would be a good time to spray just before that. Beat the pre-harvest interval. So in other words, spray about seven days before you're going to cut that off. That way you can control all the grasshoppers before they march into the field that's right next to it. The other alternative would be just to spray around the ends of your fields. So spray around the end rows with insecticide. And we often see farmers doing this for a number of different pests. Maybe it's stock borer in corn. Uh, the last time you can get around the end of the field before the corn is getting a little too tall, putting insecticide in that pass just to stop some of these bugs that are going to come out of the ditches or come out of the grassy areas uh, in waterways and so forth and move out into your field. All right, when we talk about how much defoliation does it take to justify treatment? Here are the two things we want you to look at. Number one, what's the economic injury? What I would suggest you do, since we're just talking defoliation here, is just look at all the hail charts that are out there. You can just search online for different hail charts put out by universities. At certain stages of growth, they will tell you roughly what you're going to have for yield loss, and then you just figure out, well, what's your value per bushel times the yield loss, now you know economic damage. Then take a look at how much does it actually cost to spray. Usually the insecticide is going to cost $2 and then whatever your application cost is on top of that. The other thing is just to look, if your crop is in a reproductive stage of growth, that's a pretty sensitive time. And if the grasshoppers are feeding uh, and it's going to hurt you, it's going to take away seed, well, that's a different story. Now, normally we're looking at them chewing on leaves, but if they are cutting off pods on a soybean plant, for example, or uh, feeding on the tassel or the silks or something like that on corn, well, that's gonna change the game. Then you know they're causing an economic problem and you have to get out there. The other thing to think about is, if they're not to that adult stage yet, they're still pretty easy to kill. And like Brian was saying, it doesn't cost much money. Once they reach that adult stage, it takes a little different product and perhaps a little different rate of product to control them. Well, I don't know what different product you're going to use, Darren. We, use, we used to talk about Furidan. I don't think Lorsman is any better than the pyrethroids. I really don't. If it's me, I'm still sticking with a cheap pyrethroid. It's going to be just fine. But yes, our percent control isn't going to be as good, most likely, once they've hit the adult stage. Darren mentioned this earlier, too, but if you can, spray before they hit the adult stage because we want to stop next year's grasshoppers from being there. If we can kill these bugs before they lay eggs, hey, that should help us in the long term. Well, grasshoppers are certainly important to keep out of any crop you really like. Uh, treat them when they're smaller because it's easier, and also treat them before they destroy your crop. That's a good thing to do, too. One other thing that would be really good to do on your farm is to stop our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to do that coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. 
Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Our Weed of the Week is one we don't talk often about here at Ag PhD. It's a tough rangeland weed. It's sagebrush. Well, sagebrush is a perennial weed, and that means it's going to keep coming back and back and back, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse it's every year. It's not just a weed. If you don't stop it. It's a shrub. Well, it is, and it's not a great big shrub in most cases because it's not growing in the best land. Uh, typically, it's going to get three feet tall or so, but if you do have really good, deep, heavy soils and plenty of moisture, it can get to be a 10-foot tall uh, shrub, but it's one that you want to stop. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times, I'm talking to ranchers that say, well, I don't want to spend a lot of money on the pasture. And I understand that thinking that uh, my pasture rent is only this much. I don't want to spend that much on weed control out there. I, I could just rent more pasture ground. You can, but we're running out of rangeland. We don't have a lot of pasture ground anymore, and farmers and ranchers are really having a tough time finding enough. So stopping things like sagebrush can improve your pasture so much, you're going to get so much more growth out there if you take some of these problems, some weeds out of there. Like sagebrush, for example, takes up a lot of moisture and a lot of nutrients. If you wipe it out, you're going to have easily double the grass production out there, which means your stocking uh, or your head per well, acre wait, is going to go way Before up. we say double the grass production, we can't make you that promise because you might have you might have three sagebrush plants in the field. Right, but, but the, I'm saying in that point spot, is, in that spot. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I well, if it, if we're just talking about that spot, I'd say it's going to be a lot more than that because what can happen with the sagebrush is it covers the ground, so there's no sunlight hitting the ground, and to your point, no water nutrients for those the, those grass plants. So it, it's going to improve it a lot. So we don't know what percentage it's going to increase anything, but we do know this. It's a tough weed and, and shrub to control. Normally, when we're talking about these woody species, we talk tordon or chaparral. Well, you might get a little suppression out of tordon and chaparral, and both of those have long residuals, so there's no problem with that, but it's just they're not the most effective products on sagebrush. For sagebrush, we're usually talking about spike. And if you've watched Ag PhD for many years, you probably have only heard us speak about spike about three times over 20 years well, because it's not common in our area. No, it isn't, but a pound and a half to two and a half pounds of spike per acre generally is the recommendation for sagebrush. Now, you can look in different areas of the country where sagebrush is really prevalent, and you can see one pasture literally right across the fence from another where there's no sagebrush, and another pasture is just completely loaded with it. It's that a farmer invested some money, maybe only one time, and wiped it out. Well, let's talk about this too in terms of the investment, because quite often where sagebrush is, there isn't a lot of rainfall. Well, with spike, you're going to lay it on the soil surface. Now you've got to have a significant amount of rainfall for it to get into the root and then get absorbed through that root system and kill that plant. And a lot of times what will happen is it will brown up the plant, then it'll kind of green up again a little later, and then it'll brown up again after that. Don't get too worried about that. It's probably, you're probably still going to get control, but it just takes time. Sometimes it takes two or three years before you really see the results of that spike application. Now, sagebrush can be a big problem and definitely reduces the amount of grass you can produce in your pastures. Get it under control. Use a pound and a half to two and a half pounds of spike. It's all the time we have for this week's weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next.
Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Are you looking to make a career in an ag-related field? The Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation is pleased to offer a $2,500 scholarship for students enrolled in an agricultural program for the 2018-2019 school year. The goal with this scholarship is to further the education of students who understand the importance of proper stewardship and responsible nutrient management for agriculture and society as a whole. To learn more and apply, visit rnmf.org scholarship before October 15th. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10 30 No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this agro liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us. Because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. Seeding cover crops requires attention to detail. In today's Iron Talk, I'll discuss how that can make a big difference on your farm. I spoke with a farmer recently who seeded a cover crop only to see fallow syndrome in parts of his fields the next growing season. His comment to me was, weren't cover crops supposed to eliminate fallow syndrome by keeping soil microbes alive? Well, it all depends on the cover crop blend that you choose. Don't forget, some crops like radishes, for example, don't support mycorrhizae fungi that help bring phosphorus into the roots. For that reason, we always recommend a blend of cover crops to support the diverse population of soil microbes and to serve multiple purposes. The farmer in this case actually did seed a blend of three different cover crops, but the seeding was just very uneven as they were blended all together in one tank on the drill. Now, there are two solutions to this problem. First, seed the ground twice. Put the smaller seeds in the drill and seed the field, then come back with the larger seeds. The second solution could be to get a multi-hopper air cart to go behind your drill. That way you could keep each of the cover crops in their own hoppers, ensuring an even seeding across the field. Yes, cover crops can be a big help to the soil and to future crops. Careful attention is needed, though, to spread the seeds somewhat evenly to maximize benefits and eliminate potential problems. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. That's our time for today, but before we go, we want to invite you to subscribe to the new Ag PhD Insider Magazine. We've got a lot of great content for you there in this new magazine. Just check out agphdinsider.com. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.